So today we're going to bring out something else that I think people should be aware of. How many of y'all think that we should be a light to our brother? That we should help our brother? Amen. This is what Christianity is all about. I want you to look at me with Galatians chapter 3. I want to show you some things that are very important. And I want to help you to have the knowledge to help someone else. How many of y'all believe that God is a jealous God? He's a jealous God, and what does that mean? That means that we are to serve no other gods. The problem is they have tricked the Christian people into believing a bunch of lies that has actually caused them to worship other gods ignorantly. As an example, Shekinah glory. I hear one of the guys on the radio, he claimed to be such a great man of God, and I pray that he was. He's talking about the Shekinah glory. How many of y'all know that word is not in the Bible? It's not in the Bible, and also, if you search it out and find out who that is, that's the gods that the Jews worship in the background that you're not supposed to know anything about. You're supposed to believe that's Jesus Christ and his glory. Well, that's a blasphemous lie. And Jesus said in John 8, 32, if you continue in my word, so shall you be my disciples. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. So it's, it's our duty as Christians to free the brother. If you uh, have the idea of some people have, oh, you should not say things like that. I need, you need, okay, then you need to shut up because that's a blasphemous lie. How many of y'all know that Jesus told everything and nobody listened to him? In Matthew 23, he told them about usury and their money. In Matthew 23, 14, how they took the houses of little widow women. They took her house. Her husband dies and she don't have no way to pay the bill. They just take her house. They're still doing the same thing today. You go to the group home. You go to the rest home. If you ain't paid your, if you don't have money the 61st day you're in there, that is if you have insurance. If not, they take your house if you have one the first day. But the 61st day, they put a lien on your house down at the, down at the state controller's office and whatever that is. And you know, you, you, they charge you this enormous amount of money every day. Basically, you've lost your home. They're still doing the same thing today. Of course, you're not supposed to know that. You're supposed to be ignorant. Okay, in Ephesians chapter 3, I want to give you some very important information. <clears throat> How many of you all are anointed of God? Let me hear you say amen. amen. We have His Spirit because we are His children. And <clears throat> I want you to look with me Chapter 3, verse 5 in Ephesians. When other ages, Paul said, was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto them through the holy prophets and the Spirit. So if you've got the Spirit today, I believe you can receive this. If you don't have the Spirit today, then you need to get saved, and this message is not for you. But if you have the Holy Spirit, I think you can receive this. Verse 6. Look what he revealed to them, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in the same body, partakers of the promise of Christ by the gospel. Okay, if you look at this, what that means is, if you look at this carefully, Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of Moses' law. Amen? Amen. Moses' law wrote about Zechariah 9.9. 9. The prophets wrote about it. Moses' law said, A brethren shall he, God raise up like as unto me, him shall you hear. There's hundreds of pro messianic prophetic scriptures, like Psalms 19. You look at David being the fulfillment in the shadow of Christ in many places. And you find out that Jesus is the only possible fulfillment of Moses' law. 
Why does Moses' law do not exist anymore? Because Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of Moses' law. So Moses' law has no value anymore. It talks about in the book of Hebrews, it talks about the old covenant vanished away. It's no more. Now people want to <clears throat> preach about the old covenant. They preach about it all the time. But for people to know the fullness <clears throat> of their calling, they need to know the entire Bible and basically, they need to start to find out what Jesus did to get them on the right road. And I hear an amen. amen. Because if you don't have Jesus Christ and his knowledge, you're not going to be on the right road. Now, he talked about this mainly a little bit in the Old Testament about your mind. But not very much. In a book like Joshua, uh, he talked about that in Joshua chapter 1. And we talked about them going into Canaan land, how they were to meditate in the Word, and they were to watch their mind. I think that's very important. And like I said a while ago, Hebrews 8.13, you find out that the Old Covenant is, is vanishing away. It's done with. The Jews have no covenant today, neither will they ever have again. Because Jesus Christ is eternal. He fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures and you find out that Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel. He was the fulfillment of the law of Moses. What does that mean? That means that Christians that are in him, we are the true children of God. Galatians 3.14 says that Jesus Christ the, the blessings of God came on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Ben, he was the fulfillment of Moses' law and we're in him. Say it with me, that means me. We are the children of God and we are the only true religion of Israel. The rest of them are nothing. I don't care if they're Muslim, whatever they are, Jew, Muslim, it has no difference and it doesn't really matter. Okay, so I want to take it a little farther here. Look what it says in verse 6 again, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promises in Christ by the gospel. Now, if you read the gospel enough, you can gather what I just told you, that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Moses' law. There was no actual law about the religion of Israel until Jesus Christ and Abraham come on the scene. Amen? Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of Abraham. He took upon him his blessings. Verse 7, Wherefore I am a minister according to the gift of Christ of God given to me by the effectual working of his power. And what he means by that, by the grace of God. If you feel like you're in the grace of God, let me hear you say amen. When you're in the grace of God, that's where this word effectual goes to. What does that mean? You might think you're here by accident or listening by the accident, but you know what? If you're in the grace of God, you feel good about it. You should praise God for that because many people today, they have sit in religious, I don't know, churches for so long that they're so brainwashed, they can't learn anything. So I'm going to tell you quickly where we're at. It says in verse 8 of Ephesians 3, And to me am who are less than the least of all saints, is given <clears throat> that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. This is one of the most powerful messages <clears throat> that I think is in the Bible. I mean, it's not like Jesus Christ himself, but it is because it has to do with his body. What is the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ? Well, everybody don't know today. You cannot trace his riches. If you try to see how rich God is, you can't measure it because it's untraceable. He created everything, amen? amen. Which way do you look? You can't tell me how rich he is because he owns everything. And you being in his body means that you own everything too. 
So Paul is preaching the riches of Christ. And he calls them in verse 8, unsearchable riches to tell you how rich he is. But this is such a great revelation. Look what he said now in verse 8. It's given unto me, he says, who am least of the saints. Now I want to bring you to a great revelation here that everyone that thinks they know the Bible, I've asked so far, I haven't found anyone that had this revelation that knew this in this country. And I think it's because they've listened to television, they've listened to these guys from the Dallas Theological Seminary or Liberty. There's nobody today that's actually preaching the Bible because they've got them full of these NIVs and New King James versions and all of these kind of things, which are nothing more or less than this basically witchcraft. And I'm going to tell you why they're witchcraft if I get time in this message. If not, I encourage you to be with us on Friday night, 7.30, or be with us Sunday morning at 10.30, and we'll tell you, and you'll learn a lot from our stuff. But let's look at these scriptures. The the paper that I handed out today, I want you to look what it says. And I'm going to bring this out to you, how Paul that was the least of the apostles and why that was necessary. I think it's very critical today that people learn where we're at. Now, in 1 Corinthians, I want you to turn there with me. I think it's really sad that we don't have a a group of people that's learned this all across America. But if we did, that would make the TBNers invalid. It It would invalidate their message because their message is exactly the opposite of this. Satan has taken the minds of some of them men. They have no idea what they're preaching. Why, the great men like Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, people like that, they know what they're preaching. They do it on purpose. They have actually thrown a stumbling block before you because of money. And you find the evidence of this in the Old Testament too. You can go back and look at Numbers. Chapter 22, 23, and 24, and you can find out that there's a lot of people will sell you out for money. And this is what the Gentiles are, are, are doing. The Jews, they do this all their life. This is what they do. If you notice in 1 Corinthians, I'm going to give you a couple of chapters here. One of them in 2 Corinthians. If you want to get a pencil and write this down, I'll try to come back here in a minute. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8, he said, I, for this thing, he said he had a messenger from Satan to buffet him in verse 7, and he said in verse 8, this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. This devil was on his case. And he said, God, I want you to bind this devil in heaven, for I'm binding him. I'm sure Paul said some things like that. But God told him in verse 9, he said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, Paul said, therefore, he said, I, that I glory in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. Okay, <clears throat> Paul had some weaknesses. I read that to you in Ephesians 3, 8, that he said he was least among the apostles to search to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ and that he was least among them because of what he was preaching about how rich Jesus was and how rich you are because you believed him. Now you find out in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, you find out what that's part of it is what it's about. In 1 Corinthians, <coughs> I want you to notice, <coughs> look in chapter 2, verse 1. And Paul said, I, brethren, when I came to you, I came to you not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I was with you in weakness and fear and trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of the power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, 
but in the power of God. If you look in chapter 1, verse 26, look at this. The opposite. You look at these great men, verse 26. You see, brethren, he's telling them how that not many wise men of the flesh nor mighty men or noble men are called. Okay, look what it says now in verse 27. But God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak of the world to confound them that are mighty, and base things of the world which are despised, God chosen, yea, and things that are not, that are, that are, he chose to bring them to naught, to bring, let me read that again, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And I know that we are not <laughs> in charge, not of this world anyway. But hold the idea here and look and see what this says. There's a lot of great men today that claim to be great. Why didn't Paul say he was great? He said he's the least among you. Now, I've read a little bit to you in these past 17 minutes, so I want to tell you what he's talking about. He's talking about something that's very important. The way you are trained up in this country and in this world to see the things of God is very important because you're trained up today to believe everything on Fox News or you're trained up today to see everything on uh, CNN and to watch TBN. You're trained up to believe that, but that stuff is witchcraft. It's a bunch of lies. The greatest people is you. These are the little people. What did it say in 1 Corinthians? Look there with me in chapter 6, verse 4. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 6, 4. This is a very important scripture. It's necessary for everybody to learn this scripture. If you live in this country, if you live anywhere where you are watching television, this is all they preach is the great man. How you're great if you got all this money. That's a bunch of lies. Your faith is the most important thing under the sun. God give you great faith to make you do great things. What is it? You're walking by faith. That's a great thing. These rich men cannot do that with their money. They serve their own self and their pride and their lust. It's not possible for them to serve God. They don't have faith. You can't even know him. They won't listen to anything that has to do with God. Look what it said, verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy their wisdom, God says, and I will bring to nothing uh, the understanding of the prudent and these people that trust in their own mind and what they can know. He says in verse 20, chapter 1, where is the wise man? Where's the scribe? Now I'm going to read that to you in 1 Corinthians 6, 4. I've not left you. Their wisdom of, of, of these men, the speeder of this world, God made them foolish. The wisdom of this world, he made it foolish. 1 Corinthians 6, 4 says this. <laughs> if you have any problems in this world, he said, let the least among you judge. Now most generally, every one of you would get the man in the church that's lifted up higher than anybody else and say, why don't you tell us really how this should go? But you know, I'm sorry. That's not God's point of view. God's point of view is to never listen to people that's lifted up, great men, full of pride, full of money, and these things. These are a bunch of lies. God said, you got an issue in the church? Let this little man here, he don't have no education. He don't have nothing very much at all. He don't have no money. He said, let him decide. Let him be the judge. <laughs> Is that not reverse to what they teach in this world? Amen. I mean, this is a reverse thing. This is why I'm telling you, don't trust in what you hear about Jesse Duplantis or Kenneth Copeland or Creflo Dollar, T.D. Jakes or, you know, Osteen. These are people lifted up high like the media, and you know what? They don't know nothing. Billy Graham, you look at him, I, everybody, they lift him up like he's so high. I played his, uh, his testimony for a woman not too long ago, and he says, oh, you don't have to worry. 
God, there's a wide opening in God. You may not even know Jesus, but you're a part of his calling. You're saved whether you know it or not. I remember Carlton Pearson, he said the same thing in the year 2000. Of course, they threw him off the TBN because of that, because at that time, people wasn't as brainwashed as they are today. But any time they lifted up people like Billy Graham, and all you got to do is go to the internet and type in Robert Shuler and Billy Graham denies Jesus Christ. Go type it in the internet and try me. See, I think people should know them that labor among you. Can I hear an amen? amen. We're living in times now. People need to know the truth. I'm tired of the devil trying to dominate people and control them through the media. The media is the people that's rich. That's the people we're talking about. You think they're going to tell you the truth? No. You think they're behind it? Yes. That's the people that print these fake books they call revised versions of the Bible. Hold on to your King James Version because pretty soon they'll outlaw it. <clears throat> we're living in those times. They've already did it in California. They stopped the sale of it. But I don't care what the devil does. Can I hear an Amen. But look what it said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look what it says. <clears throat> Verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews or Greeks, Christ, he's the power of God, and he's the wisdom of God. Verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So you see, when you look at these things, you find out that God is such a good God and that he called the little people to serve him. Now, one of the things that we preached about for the past few months, we talked about the new man. How many of y'all know what the new man is? Yes, born again people, that's the first part. The second part is you might be born again, but if you're listening to a dogmatic lying spirit, you're not going nowhere. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How are you going to hear the right thing if you got a Bible like an NIV? I had a lady to call me at 11 o'clock, I think it was, Friday night for our midnight prayer meeting. She said, I heard you say on the radio here in Pittsburgh that NIV Bibles had taken out Matthew 17, 21, and sure enough, I looked and it's not in my Bible. She said, that scares me. I said, that's good. You need to know what these devils are trying to do. You can't have any faith if you don't have a real Bible. Now, if you really want to know what makes you to put on this new man that the Bible talks about in Colossians 3.10 and Ephesians 4.24, I want you to turn back to Ephesians with me. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 3. I said, if you want to learn about the new man, get a real Bible and start programming your mind. Start memorizing scriptures. If you've got a pastor that's not preaching out of a King James and a real Bible, get rid of him. If he's ignorant and he don't want to listen, cast him away and find you somebody else. And before you listen to him, go home. Don't support pastors like that. If they receive it and, they, and they've got enough sense to receive it, fine. Help them. Bless them. But don't stand with anybody that's not standing with your Bible. Romans 12, 2 said we're transformed. You want to come from the old man into the new man, you got to be more than just born again. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind, remembering his scriptures. Amen? John 8, 32, I used to, I mean, I got a great revelation out of this. I thought for years I understood this scripture. Jesus said to the Jews, if you continue in my word so shall you be my disciples. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. How many of y'all know that they didn't get free? Now, many people are born again, but they're not free. They didn't get free because of being able to shake their body. Oh, you ain't listening to me. Ain't nobody even said amen. 
They didn't get free by shaking their body. They didn't get free by being a Baptist. They didn't get free from saying once saved, always saved. They didn't get free from joining a church or denomination. They got free from staying, staying in a King James Bible. If you don't stay with the Bible, you're not going to ever be free. He said, if you continue in my word, so shall you be my disciples. You'll know the word and the word will make you free. We're under attack today and the minds of people are so blinded they don't even know it. Oh, they're sending guys money that is actually their enemy. Isn't that cool? How many of y'all know the people inadvertently give money to the devil? Come on, we got some of the most powerful witches in this country that's right here on our television networks and people don't even know it. I'm not going to beg people to believe me. Look at your Bible. Get a revelation. Jesus said in Luke 12, you discern the skies. You can look at it and see when it's you know, red and the wind coming out of the south, you know it's going to get hot. You can know things like that, but you can't know things about our Bible because you don't read it. You don't have any discernment. People don't even believe in fasting and prayer anymore. And I think we're living in times today when people need to be awakened. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> in Ephesians chapter 3, I've told you about the new man. I've told you how to put him on. If you don't put on the new man according to the scriptures, you can go to any church you want to, stay as long as you want to. If you don't know your Bible, and if your preacher ain't preaching a Bible like a King James Version only, I'm sorry, you're not going anywhere. You can't have faith without a King James Bible. You can't have faith out of an NIV. Oh, well, let's turn here with the NIV. It's easier to understand. You lying devil, shut up. Get away, devil. You're a liar, and it's all about money and all about deception. In Ephesians, I want you to look at me with this again. I want you to go back with me to the second chapter of Ephesians. Now, if you look, I told you last week... <coughs> Let me give you a couple of verses in Ephesians 1, and then we'll continue. In Ephesians 1, verse 19. This is a very important group of scriptures I'm about to give you, so get your pen and pencil in your hand. Write them down. And in Ephesians 1, 19, he said, What is the exceeding greatness... Notice he said exceeding great. Now, I want to say this right here, that God is not only great, he goes so much farther than greatness that it's unspeakable. Paul tells you that in Ephesians, I think it is 3.20 or 22, he says, you know, far above anything you can ask or think. That's what kind of power God's got. But he says the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe in a certain thing according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ and raised him from the dead and set him at his right hand in heavenly places. That's the body of Christ. He is the high priest under the Lord God our Father. And he sets at the right hand. You find that out in Ephesians or Hebrews chapter 7. But nevertheless, the whole point about it is, where is that? At the body of Christ in heaven, it says in verse 21, he's far above. This is how much more powerful that God is. He's far above principalities, powers, mights, dominions, and there's no name like Jesus Christ. And he gives that name, if you follow this closely, I mean, he's made him to be the head over everything. Verse 22 and 23, the church is what we're talking about here because the believers go into the body of Christ. Can I hear an Amen. So if Jesus has all the power over the devil, what happens when you go into the body of Christ? Say it with me, say power. power. He said, in my name you shall cast out devils and heal the sick. I love people that know how to tell the devil, devil, you're a liar, I bind you and cast you out in the name of Jesus. How I many of y'all believe you've got the power of healing in your life? Come on, say amen. amen. Every one of you got the power to heal the sick. He said, in my name, in Mark 16, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. 
All of the gifts of the Holy Ghost are in you if you're saved and receive the Spirit of God. Nevertheless, look what it says. Jesus Christ in verse 21, chapter 1. He's far above all the principalities, powers, minds, and dominions. That's powers of the devil. But look, the good part about it is he speaks about the church. You see this in verse 22? He's talking about the church. <clears throat> then he talks about the body in verse 23. That's the fullness of him. Do you want to know where God is? He's at the right hand of God, but you want to know in the eyes of God where we are, we're in the body of Christ, we're sitting right there with him. And if you look in chapter 2, verse 1, he talks about what God has done for us. He said, And you had thee quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, who walked according to the course of this world, and the prince and the power of the air, that now worketh in the children of disobedience. But, this is really good here, verse 3, among whom we also had our conversation in time past, lust and the fulfilling of the desires of the flesh by the man, whereby nature we were the children of God. But I want you to look in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, while we were dead in sins, he quickened us together. So he made us to rise with Christ Jesus. We're no longer under the power of Satan. We live in the body. Jesus was given the power. We're given the power. Can I hear an amen? There's no devil has the power to cast out a devil because his house would stand divided. But the children of God that's anointed of Jesus Christ, we got power to trade upon serpents and scorpions and nothing by any means shall harm us. Can I hear an amen? amen. Look what it says in verse 6. And you hath he raised us up and made set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That means there's no devil can ever have any power over us. It's only through the ignorance that you're hearing today through these ignorant preachers that want you to believe in the Bible. Amen. Those people can really get brainwashed. Look what it says. Verse 7, Then ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness to us through Jesus Christ. We will be kings one day sitting on our throne. Today is not our day, but one day judgment will be given to us. If you've been faithful over a few things, he'll make you ruler over much. He'll help you to tread over serpents and scorpions. Here's the good thing. Look what he did to make you successful. In verse 8, And grace by you saved through faith. And that's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. God gives you the power that the devil cannot defeat. This is why they want to get rid of your Bible. This is why they want you to believe in a Hollywood God that will give you millions of dollars. That's a lie from the pits of hell. We've got faith that takes you greater than money. Money is going to fail. Rothschild is going to pull the banks down so you don't have any real money anymore. But God's going to have a people that's got faith and they're going to say, Devil, I'm not tied by your money. I got something greater than money. It's called faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Ghost, if God be for you, who can be against you? Amen? Amen. Grace. Say it with me, say grace. grace. This is the protective custody of God. How do you stay in it? By faith. Can you have faith without a real Bible? No. I mean, you can't gain anything. Romans 10, 17, we have faith of continually hearing the word of God. It builds our faith. Hebrews 5, 14, you know what it says? You know, we have strong meat and milk who by reason of using our spiritual senses, stand in the word of God, it strengthens us inwardly, outwardly, keeps our flesh healthy. And this is what we are. We are the children of the living God. Can I hear an amen? amen. We have faith and that's what God gives you to make you a powerful warrior. We have the gift of faith. I want you to notice this. Look what it said in verse 9. Not of works. It's a faith. Now it gets real good in Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now we're anointed of God for a job. Amen? Amen. We are anointed of God to do something specific. What is it? We're supposed to be at work. 
That's what the faith was for. That's why he took us and put us over the power of Satan. That we're coming to this world, bring it under subjection, those that will listen. And we do that by staying in our grace, staying in the grace of God, staying in our faith, and preaching the word of God. The devil can't get into the grace of God. We're translated into the kingdom of his dear son, and there's no policeman over here called Satan. Amen? Amen. We got power to cast him out. And it says in verse 10, we're his workmanship. Do you know God made you? How did he make you? First of all, it says in Ephesians 1, 3, that he blessed you before the foundation of the world. I mean, this is really good that he talks about in verse 4 of Ephesians 1, that he, first of all, put his own love inside of us. Do you know you are love? You're the creation of God. They don't have nothing like you in this world. They got people that's born of the flesh or born of Satan and they don't have any idea who you are, what you're about. They don't know us. Amen? They don't know you. They don't know who you are. People look like you. You just look like you're nobody. Praise God for that. I'm not a great man. I'm not a mighty man. I'm not a rich man. I'm not a famous man, but I'm a child of the living God, and my faith will keep me walking above Satan. Amen? Amen. And we are his workmanship. He made us in verse 10, created us in Jesus Christ. That's what we are when we went into his body. That's what you are in the body of Christ. You became powerful, having all power over those same demons that Jesus has power over. You know what? Look what he said here. He ordained you for good works that you should walk in them. You know what? Every day you keep the Satan and the devil under your feet. Every day you live. You get up in the morning, you bind him. You say, devil, of witchcraft, mind control, I cast you out in the name of Jesus. That's all he's got is mind control. Come on, he can't come down and, and twist you up if you don't let him get in your mind. Satan can't do anything if you don't keep him out of, I mean, he can't do nothing as long as you keep him out of your mind. Amen? Because you've got to keep your flesh dead. How do you do that? You bind that devil, stay in the blood. Stay in the blood, stay in faith, casting that devil out. So we are ordained to walk in good works. That means it's every day. If you walk, apparently that's you. That's what you're supposed to do. We come together, and this is what it means in this chapter 3, Verse 9, it talks about fellowship of the mystery which was uh, from the beginning of the world had been hid in God. The word fellowships talk about effectual. It has a word there called effectual. Now, we don't ever use that word hardly. I don't know that we ever use it in our everyday life, but it's a continual working together for a purpose. This word fellowship is very important because it talks about... <coughs> I brought it out in one of our studies. It talks about coming together for the purpose of benefaction. How many of y'all understand that word? Benefaction is another word we hardly ever use, but it means to, for a specific purpose. We come forth to minister to people. We come forth to bring them the truth, to do a good work. Fellowship, look what he said of the mystery. They didn't know what we was going to do. They didn't know that God was going to bring a bunch of Gentiles like us and a bunch of nobodies that wasn't worth living. And he would raise us up to make us to be somebody. Raise us up to make us have the power of God. Raise us up to make us tread upon serpents and scorpions. But we come together for a purpose, and he's called it fellowship. That means Paul was this person you're talking about here. If you go back in your Bible just a little bit, Verse number 2, Ephesians 3, look at that. Dispensation of grace given unto him to you word, to you word. That means that Paul was anointed of God for a specific purpose. God made him an apostle to these people at, at, at Ephesians. He made him an apostle, gave him power, and he was to be a steward. His stewardship over them. In other words, he said, man, God has told me to keep you all in the grace of God. See what it said in verse 2? Dispensation of grace. Paul was appointed. Look at the word dispensation. He was appointed in the grace of God to keep these people in the grace. He had to tell them the truth. He tells them this stuff in chapter 2 and chapter 1 about them having the power, 
about Satan is way, and I don't want to say this and em emphasize it too much, but he, Satan is so far down that he's way, way down under our feet. Can I hear an amen? amen? I mean, he may be over the power of men, but he's Mickey Mouse when it comes to God. That's what it's all about. He ain't nothing. You can cast him out easy. Your faith will bring everything into your life at the appropriate time. Amen? Amen? So Paul had been given a stewardship. Now what is the stewardship? That means that God told you to do certain things and one day you have to give an account for that. All of us have to give an account for what God told us to do. But his was to keep this church in the grace of God. So he's preaching all this stuff to them. So the things I'm preaching to you today will keep you in the grace of God. If you get out of this, you're out of God. You learn to be what God called you to be. You learn that you are in Jesus. And he was raised up over all the powers of Satan. And in chapter 1, I mean, you've got to look at this very carefully, man. It says in verses 20. 22 and 23, that you are in the body, you are in the church, so apparently you have the same power. If God raised you up above the power of the devil, what does that make you? Say it with me. More than the devil. We're in the body of Christ. It's the body. Now, a lot of people claim to be in the body, but you know, I'm sorry. You worshiping them money gods from TBN, you ain't in nothing but trouble. But you learn about walking by faith and you learn about ministering to yourself with the scriptures, learning about doing your own Bible study, learn how to get a Strong's Bible concordance and how to stay in it. You can do some great things, man. Keep on feeding your faith. That's very important. Now, I want you to look at this chapter two. I've got a little bit of time. So I want you to notice that after he's made you able... For verse number eight, he says, by grace are you saved through faith. And this was a very powerful gift of faith, which comes from Colossians chapter one, verse 27. And it comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, chapter 12, I mean, in 1 Corinthians 12. And it helps you to have the faith of God that he give you to make you successful and powerful. Jesus came into you not with a lesser power. He come into you to bring you into his own body. That's what it's about, to make you powerful. Aren't you glad? Amen? Amen. He came into you to call you unto his self. Because if you went any other place, it wouldn't work. Okay, look at chapter 2 in Ephesians, verse 11 and 12. Wherefore, well, remember that being in times past, he said you was just Gentiles in the flesh, called uncircumcision in the flesh, made by hands. That at that time, you were without Christ and you was alien from a commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise. You have no hope and you was without God in the world. Verse number 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes afar off, said women, said that was me. <laughs> he said, are made nigh by the blood of Jesus. I look at people today that really need to get a revelation of this. Man, when you are sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, it comes because you have told God, you said, okay, God, I will. You have told God, you said, I will. I will obey you, I will obey the word, and I will stay with you, God. Then you get in a covenant with him and he sprinkles you with that blood, and when that royal blood is sprinkled on you, you become a royal person, amen? amen. Then you learn about this grace he's talking about in verse number seven, that it's only when you're walking in the power of God, that's only for people that's been sprinkled by the blood. Ain't no people unsaved can walk in the grace of God because they are not royal. Amen. 1 Peter 2, 9, we're a chosen royal generation. Amen? Amen. 1 James, in James's Gospel, chapter 2, around verse 8 and 10, he talks about the royal law. You know what that is? That's blood. It's people been sprinkled by the blood. We've got to love the brethren. It's what we do. We love one another. 
Amen? <clears throat> so you find out this royal blood we've been sprinkled with makes you a special somebody. Yes, we are special. We are blessed of God. Now I want you to notice something. <clears throat> what happens in verse 15 and verse 20 and 21. In verse 15, you find out that we, all of us together in the body of Christ, are now Jews and Gentiles. Whoever you are, if you come into the body of Christ, that's why we love one another. See, you're a royal person if you come into the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. This makes you somebody. Look what it said in verse 15. There's no more Jew or Gentiles. We're one new man. We was made one person. And I want to tell you something. We're all equal in the love of God. Amen? And we're this one new man. This is the body. As Christ is the head of the body, we are in the body, and there is no if and ands. We are the one new man. And it says in verses 20, and this one new man is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. This is the gospels that we're preaching. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the letters to the church. This is what we preach. This is what we live off of. This is what we build our faith from. The one new man that is the body of Christ and he is to be strengthened by this. In verse 21, he takes us. <clears throat> I like this, man. This is really powerful. Now the Bible said in the last of this verse 20, let me read that to you. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So he's got the building together. That's what keeps it all lined up and keeps it straight and so forth. But verse number 20 talks about every one of us is fitly joined together in the body. That means according to your gift. You may not have the gift I got, but praise God, if you're saved, you got a gift. Amen? You got a job to do. I don't care what it is. Whether it's mop, sweep, it's a, it's a privilege to get to clean the toilets. It's a privilege to do anything for God because you're not doing it for man. Amen. We do what we do for God. It's a privilege to be able to tithe and to be faithful over your tithe. You're doing it for God. You're not doing it for man. Don't live with a minute mind trying to figure out you can't make ends meet or not. Prove God. Learn to prove God. Now look at this word fitly. See that in verse 21? In other words, God, you, God has got you exactly made. You're his creation from chapter 2, verse 10. God made you, and he made you to fitly join in to this body. Whatever your gift is, God made you that. God made you able. Can I hear an amen? amen. And God made you capable. Can I hear an amen? amen? And God gave you this great grace. I mean to tell you, God gave you this great faith that keeps you in the grace of God. And he fiddly puts you into the body in this specific place. You find that in Romans chapter 12. How he puts you in the grace of God and he fiddly made you. Now if you notice something in verse 22. In whom we also are builded together for a habitation of God through the spirit. That's the body of Christ. And he dwells in all of us. This is what we are, who we are, and this is what we do. Amen? We are to be his workmanship in verse 10, preaching the gospel, casting out devils, healing the sick, protecting our children, keeping their minds pure, keeping them separated from the education of the world through all of this uh, education that we're fighting today. How many of y'all got your own pet dinosaur at home? Anybody got one? Huh? I mean, come on, if you're from the Neanderthal man, or maybe you got this from, what's his name? The guy that was on television, Flintstones. I think they used to have a little dinosaur they carried around on the rope, didn't they? The ideal is, if you believe in the dinosaurs, you got to believe that you came from a tadpole. It's the same thing. That's the same education group that done it. So we don't get educated on that. Amen? Go over with me to 1 Timothy. I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. People today that, oh, I believe it because they said it was scientifically proven. You big liar, shut up. I'm preaching devil, not you. Cast you out, devil, in Jesus' name. 
So you got to learn the truth. Amen? Amen. How many of y'all got your own private spaceship? Fled Friendstone had one. Oh, you can get one, brother. All you got to do is be cool. God gave Jesse to planners. His jet airplane, he give you your spaceship. Yeah. Yeah, if you believe in cartoons, and that's who created them in Hollywood, they can create all that stuff. But look what it said in 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. I want you to look at this. If thou be put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourish up in the words of faith. Look at the word nourished. If you look that up in Strong's Bible Concordance, it's very easy to find it. And I'm going to tell you what it means. I know what it means, but I'm going to help you with this a little bit. <clears throat> it tells you in 1789, that's the Greek section. It says educate. Now, in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8, it says that we Christians are dead from the rudiments of the world. You know what that is? That's way back there where the world started, man. That's right from the very roots of it. There is no part of the world that you're supposed to believe in. Oh, it's scientifically proven. You're a liar, devil. It ain't scientifically proven that my daddy is a tadpole. You're a lying devil. Amen? Amen. And you're a lying devil about... Fled, Fred Flintstone and his, all that stuff. Oh, I got a dinosaur on the way now. Yeah, I know, you ordered it from China. Everybody can get one if they order it from China. It ain't hard to get. They come over here and plaster Paris, and then uh, the Jewish guy that owns the museum, he turn around and tell you, oh yes, this was dug up from a great place in Montana. You're a liar, devil. Shut up and go away. I don't believe in that kind of crap, Amen. How many of y'all know that John 3, 16 says, and they had their own spaceship and they flew back and forth to Mars? <laughs> this is so idiot. People that don't know anything about their Bible, they believe that stuff. Oh, it's scientifically proven. You have to believe it. No, you have to teach your stuff and serve your God. And that's what Jesus said to them in John chapter 8. I do what my father told me to do. You do what your father told you to do. Can I hear an Amen. This is the difference in us. We, the children of God, we have the things that we call life. We have the word of God that gives us life. It says you're nourished up. One of the other things that you learn about wholesome words. Y'all know what wholesome words mean? Huh? Wholesome words. You stay with your Bible. You want to be healthy? We got a lot of people today that are unhealthy. And I believe if you learn this, you'll be a good, good soldier. Wholesome words. And you find that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. And the number on that is 5198. Now you know what this tells you? In bodily health, the advantage you have over other people when you stay with your Bible, you're educated, you've got a renewed mind, I talked about that in this message. Romans 12, 2, we're renewed in our mind. You put on the new man. You get educated correctly. And you know, you got health in your body. They want you to get rid of your Bible because they don't want you to have any of these things. I can see the devil is a liar, amen? amen? So Paul said in Galatians 6, he said, I am crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me. Remember Colossians 2, 8 that you're dead from the rudiments of the world. You go right down to the roots where they started at, I'm dead from there, devil. I don't want any of your stuff. No, not any of it. No, I don't believe in your witchcraft or whatever you want to call it. Oh, you have to believe in our science. Shut up, devil. I mean, the devil wants you to believe in a lot of stuff. If you had your fluoride today, it'll help your teeth. We know that's a bunch of lies, Amen. We that are Christians, we keep our Bible. We can have a lot of fun preaching and a lot of fun ministering to one another. I want to encourage everybody, get your prayer life together, stay in your Bible, love your brother, and try to keep them with the knowledge of your King James Bible. It's the greatest thing 
that's perfect and closest to the truth. With a good Strong's Bible concordance, you can learn how to study yourself. It's not so hard, you can't do it. You just have to make an effort. And it requires <coughs> spending time doing this. The Bible said in Ephesians 5 that we're to redeem the time. Every minute is so very vitally important. And I encourage every one of you, love one another, pray for one another, but I, I believe in due time, it'll pay off with great dividends. What do we have with our hope? Hope is something you can't see right now. It's what's in our future. I believe there's a rapture coming. Amen? Amen. I believe we're going to sit on thrones one day. Amen? Amen? While the tribulation is in act here in this world, I believe Isaiah chapter 20, 26, I think it is. I think if you look at that real close, it tells you that we're going to be in a place with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it tells you all about this. Chapter 26, verses 19. 19 through 21. We're going to be in a place until the indignation is passed. What are we going to be doing? I don't know. We're probably having a wedding supper. Amen? But we won't escape tribulation. That's in our future too. We got a great meeting in the air with the Lord Jesus. I'm looking forward to that. I think the time is growing near. I want you to pray for people. Get a good prayer life. Remember, they had group prayer in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 4 verse 31. They shook the place because they were praying together. In Acts chapter 12, they got together at midnight and were praying at night time. And an angel brought Peter out of prison. In Acts chapter 16, they had midnight prayer and God shook the foundation of the prison. And not only did he deliver Peter, or not only did he deliver Paul, but everybody that was in jail. Luke chapter 11 talks about the midnight prayer. We always practice that. We love it. It's a great part of the Bible. Lift your hands and let's pray for those that today, today are having problems. I want to pray for those in the rest homes. I want to pray for the elderly people that are being mistreated now, that don't have the food they need, that are being forced to take mental medications, even our soldiers. Pray with me right now and lift your hands and let's pray together. Father, we thank you. Lord, we love you right now. We ask you, Lord, to take care of our soldiers. Lord, we ask you to deliver them. Lord, have mercy on the people in the group homes, in the rest homes. Have mercy on our children. Father, we love you right now and we thank you for them. We ask you, Lord, to minister to them. And Lord, we pray right now for all the saints of God that's watching our program that they'll receive this. I want you to believe with us for healing right now. Say it with me. Say, sickness, we bind you, devil. We cast you out in Jesus' name. Come on, those of you that are sick, put your hand on the spot and let's pray together. If you're sick in your chest or your stomach, bowels, let's pray right now. Devil, we bind you and cast you out. Sickness, we cast you out in Jesus' name. We bind you, devil, now. We cast you out in Jesus' name. Lift your hand now, tell him, now, Father, fill me with the Holy Ghost. And Father, I thank you right now for health and healing, all in the blessed name of Jesus. Give the Lord a good hand clap.